Thank you, Mark. And congratulations, seniors and parents. You have survived. How many of you parents are glad that your children are leaving the house? And you would admit, oh, there you go, some brave ones. God bless you. It takes a lot of courage to tell the truth, doesn't it? No, I know what you mean. You're ready for them to go on to the next step. Amen. I saw some of you parents walked them down the aisle, and you, you didn't want to let them sit by themselves. You wanted to come up and sit with them. That was cute. Uh, that was so much fun. But it was fun to watch you guys. Well, guys, today I want to bring a message to you. That's right. Someone said, Pastor, are you aware this is your last Sunday as senior pastor? I said, yes, but you know what? For 28 and a half years, it's really not been about me. Though there have been times when I've fretted over that. There's no doubt I'm human. But I would also say to you kids, it's really not about y'all. It's almost about you today, but not all the way. It's really about how can I help you? What would I say to you as a pastor, as your pastor, all of you I've known. That's what's scary when, you, when the kids come across and you realize you know them all and you realize that's been the best part of your job. What would I say to you? Well, I want to talk to you today about having a life that counts, a life that matters. If you're watching the news lately, you know that uh, that's getting harder and harder to realize. Because so much of what we see on the news and in our media today is uh, untoward and unhappy. Even this morning, I couldn't uh, help but understand that what took place in London, they're talking about that and the terrorist attacks, etc. So I know that we're living in a troubled time, but I don't want to bore you with that. I don't, want to, I don't want to tell you about doom and gloom today. I want to talk to you about your future. I want to talk about whether that future be in Lubbock, Texas or Waco or out in uh, California or Florida, wherever it is you go, that you be people with a life that counts. And that at the end of your time, when you're as old as old Pastor Sam, when you're 67 and your hair has turned white, but you're still cool, amen, <laughs> when you get to where I am, that you could look back and say, you know, I mattered. I mattered. Take your Bible and turn with me to the book of Daniel. And kids, use your cell phones or whatever you need, your iPads, or just make a mental note. We're going to look at Daniel. And I want to call your attention to the first six chapters. No, I'm not going to read all six chapters. But uh, that's where my study comes from today. That's where my message comes from because that's the historical part that all scholars, biblical and otherwise, would say probably took place just about the way it's recorded there. Daniel was a real-life person. If you were to go to Susa today, which is in the southwest corner of Iran, just to the east of the Tigris and Euphrates and what's now Iran, the Babylonian Empire had spread even into the area of what was known as Persia back then. And Susa, there is a tomb there, which they say is the remains of Daniel. Daniel made a lasting impact. Daniel made a difference. A boy from Judah, taken into captivity, who made a difference. Please stand with me as we read from chapter 1, the first few verses. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand with some of the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them into the land of Shinar, to the house of his God, and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. Then the king commanded Asphanaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of nobility, youths without blemish, of good appearance, and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace. The creme de la creme. And to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years. And at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Now among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belteshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach, and Azariah he called Abednego. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. May God bless him 
and all of us with the reading of his word. Obviously, I'm always honored to preach. The deacons this morning came into the study where I was or the, the boardroom. It was more than we normally have. I'd usually just have a team of them, and I think there was about 20 or 30 of them, and they prayed one last time with their pastor, uh, which is something I've always enjoyed, my favorite time. And I think they were rehearsed because they didn't thank God for the past. They prayed and thanked God for our future, Belinda and I's future. I needed to hear that today. Be reminded that God has a plan for me. And I want to remind you that God has a plan for you, Paige Laro and Pamela Murphy. Brother Crape, I want to remind you that God has a great plan for your life. And you can find it in his word. In the story of Daniel, let me bring you up to speed. This was a wonderful man. He would have been the Cram de la Cram. He graduated probably from Plano West or maybe Plano Senior High or he was homeschooled. He probably would have been headed to Baylor, do you think? Or Texas Tech? A&M. That's what you're thinking, Hunter. Yeah, A&M. He was headed somewhere. He had his life in front of him. He looked forward, like all young Jewish boys, to being married to a beautiful wife one day out of a royal family. We don't know for sure. The Bible never says whether he was made to be a eunuch, but we do know this, that he worked under the eunuchs and likelihood was that he was. Daniel never came home. Even though the Jews were brought back, 50,000 of them released by King Cyrus when he came and took charge, that Persian king, when he came and took charge, he sent some back, but Daniel did not return. He lived over 70 years in the area of ancient Babylon and now Persia. And he made a difference. What will God do with you? Will you make a difference in your life? I think you can. I know you can. It doesn't matter whether you graduated the top of your class, magna cum laude, as they say, or as Pastor Sam says every year, boom, boom, praise the laude. Amen. Which is what I did. God can use you and will use you if you're obedient to him. There are three or four things that I want to give you out of the life of Daniel that you can take to the bank, put it in your bucket so it won't slosh out. Keep it there. Number one, Daniel had a life that counts because it was a life that kept its promises. Verses 8 through 9 of chapter 1, it says, Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. Matter of fact, the story goes on to say that he said to him, I will get in trouble if I let you do this. And Daniel looked for an opportunity. He said, let me run a test by you. Try it for 30 days. Now, a lot of people have made much to do about what he was talking about, the food, that he didn't want to drink wine or he didn't want to eat certain kinds of meat. There was no doubt that the kosher diet was part and plan of the law of Judah and the land of Judah. But I think it was more than that. Many scholars say that the problem was that this was food that was brought to the king's table that was also offered and gave credence and value in the offering that it came from God, their God. And so the defilement for 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 Daniel and the rest of the men was not that it was just bad food or the wrong kind of food to eat. It had a wrong purpose behind it. And so he knew what kind of food he could eat. He knew that if he asked for a vegetarian diet, that that vegetarian diet would be brought to him and it would not pass by the king's table. It would be brought specially to him. It would have no confluence with anything else. Daniel was committed to that. And here's the bottom line, guys. I'm trying to tell you that there are some commitments that you need to make in life. There are some things in which you need to make a stand at. When I grew up uh, in a Baptist church, when I was back in the 50s and 60s, we used to preach against everything. We were more known for what we were against than what we were for. And thank God we're not like that anymore. But my fear is we also now are not known for not only what we're not against, uh, we're also not known for what we're for anymore. I would ask you, what are you for? What do you believe? What are you convicted about? What, what do you stand on? God's Word? Then read it. Do you believe in prayer? Then pray. Do you believe in the gospel? Then share it. A life without conviction and a life without commitment is not much of a life at all. You're just a consumer, and God didn't call you to be a consumer. We've got enough of that. We've had a whole generation, my generation, we boomers, we, have, we are the epitome of consumerism. We spend our lives getting and gaining and collecting. And you guys have rebelled against that. You young millennials have said, we're not going to be like them. Well, what are you going to be? What do you believe in? What do you stand for? What do you want to do? Pastor, I want to make a difference to those who are hungry. Well, then feed them. 
Pastor, I want to make a difference in science. I want to find a cure in medicine. Well, then find it. What are you committed to? What are the things you make your stand on? A life that counts is a life that keeps its promises. The second thing I'd have you look at is a life that counts is a life that prays. You knew I'd sneak that one in. Well, normally I won't. I'll be honest with you. I'm not much of a prayer warrior. My wife is. For 28 and a half years as your pastor, my wife has risen most mornings. And for an hour or more, she has prayed not only for me but for you. I stand on the heels and under the shadow of her great prayers. She's not a special person in in any other way other than she's my wife and I love her. But I tell you what, she is committed to prayer. And what we've discovered in our life, young people, is that prayer really matters. There's going to come a time in your life when you'll come up against something that you cannot do on your own. Some of the most talented and, and faithful and wonderful people in all of Plano come to this church and have gone in and out of this church. But I can assure you, in my 28 years as a pastor, I've seen even those people come up against wit's end corner when they didn't know which way to turn. Prayer matters. When you take time to pray, God can use that. In chapter 2, verses 12 through 18, you find an interesting story. Let me read it for you. The king had been having some dreams Nebuchadnezzar had, and he was having trouble with those dreams. He wanted them to be interpreted. So he went to all the wise men and the counselors, and he said, Tell me what I'm dreaming about. And they said, Well, no, we want to interpret your dreams. Tell us what you're dreaming He said, no, no, I I don't even want to tell you that. I want you to help me. I'm confused about all this. And so he said, I want you to tell me about my dreams. They couldn't do it. And he said, well, if you can't do it, I'll kill you all. Because of this, the king was angry and furious and commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be destroyed. So the decree went out and the wise men were about to be killed. And they sought Daniel and his companions to kill them. Why? Because they were of the wise men too. Then Daniel replied with prudence and discretion to Arioch, the captain of the king's guard, who had gone out to kill the wise men of Babylon. He declared to Arioch, the king's captain, Why is the decree of the king so urgent? Then Arioch made the matter known to Daniel, and Daniel went in and requested the king to appoint him a time that he might show the interpretation to the king. In other words, he went to Arioch. He couldn't go straight to the king. went to Arioch to go request of the king that he might talk to him. So Arioch did. Then Daniel went to his house and made the matter known to Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. He's not gone to the king yet. What is he doing? He told his companions to seek mercy from the God of heaven concerning this mystery so that Daniel and his companions might not be destroyed with the rest of the wise men of Babylon. In other words, Daniel came to a place as skilled as he was, as sharp as he was, as much in favor as he was. His life was about to come to an end. And he prayed. Pastor, I trust my own ability. I know you do. So do I. I'm a boomer. I live in West Plano. I pay my own bills. I can still do push-ups and set-ups. I can take care of myself. Listen, there are things in my life, I will tell you the sweetest things in my life, have been the time when I came up to something I couldn't get it done. I'm going to tell you a story. Pam, I'm going to tell you a story. Years ago, when I was about 60 years of age, we were very discouraged I was discouraged. Belinda wasn't. She never got discouraged. It was me. And I thought the church wasn't moving forward in my leadership, and I was worried. And we were behind in our budget about $100,000 or more. The board was looking at me like a cow looks at a new gate. Pastor, what are you going to do? And I was looking back at them. I didn't have an answer. And I was very depressed. So I came home. In that depression, and Belinda and I began to pray. About that time, I got a call from another church. Now, churches typically call preachers when they're 45, 38, 45, maybe 50. But when you're 60 years old, you don't get a call from another church. But another church called me. It was a miracle, I thought. I said, Pastor, I want you to come be our preacher. Hmm. Come be our preacher. On one condition that you mentor some young man to take your place. If you'll do that, we'll guarantee your salary for so many years. I thought, wow, maybe so. So I went home to Belinda, and I said, baby doll, I got a call today from this church. She looked at me, and she said, do you feel called to go there? I started crying. I said, no, I don't. She said, where are you called to be? And I said, that crazy church over on the tollway. But honey, it's terrible. 
She said, well, let's pray. We got out on our knees in the living room right there on Steeplechase Drive. She put her hands on my shoulders and prayed over me. And we asked God to do something, anything. When I got up, she looked at me. She said, let me ask you a question. Who's the highest paid person over there at that Parkley Hills Baptist Church? I said, well, I am. She said, well, then I suggest you go back to work. <laughs> so I did. On my way, I stopped at Target, walked into the Target store, and I did what I always do. I saw a lady behind the cash register, and I said to her, where do you go to church? Oh, Pastor Sam, every time you come in here, you ask me that question. I said, well, I was just wondering. She said, well, I'm a single parent, and I'm busy. On Sundays, I'm only day of rest. I said, I'd love to see you come and bring those babies to church. If you'd let me know how we could pick you up, I'd be glad to do that. And she said, okay, I'll, I'll try. And I went on. About a month and a half later, a man asked for an appointment. They'd been visiting the church. He walked into my office. He said, Pastor Sam, God asked me to come in and talk to you today. And I said, well, good. He said, we want to join the church. And I said, that's great. He said, but I need to catch up on my tithe. That's real good, I thought. Amen. <laughs> he said, normally I wouldn't do this. But God said, I needed to do this to you personally. And he took out his check. It's for $100,000. It evened up our budget. And I began to cry, and he said, but that's not the only reason I'm here, to give you the money. I want to tell you a story. And I don't know why, but I want you to know this. About a month and a half ago, my wife was at a Target store at Park in Parkwood. And she was standing in line. And in the line, she was behind a man with white hair who asked the cash register to come to his church and was nice to her. We'd been praying for a church. And that day, she came home to me and said, Honey, I think we found our church. Listen to me. I've got a thousand stories like that. Of times when I fell to my knees and said, God, I can't do this. I can't go forward. I don't know what to do, God, without your help without a miracle, without you doing something, without you telling me who you are and reminding me of how you work. I can't go another step. Kids, a life that counts is one that prays, one that understands that God is our provider, not man, that all that we have and all that we might be comes from his hand, not ours. The third thing I would tell you today about Daniel is I think if you're going to have a life that counts it will be a life that bears a witness for God. In Daniel chapter 2, verse 26, the story goes on. The king declared to Daniel, whose name is Belteshazzar, Are you able to make known to me the dream that I have seen and his interpretation? You see, Daniel had prayed. Daniel answered the king and said, No wise men, enchanters, magicians, or astrologers can show to the king the mystery that the king has asked. No man can do that. But there is a God in heaven who reveals mysteries, and he has made known to King Nebuchadnezzar what will be in the latter days. Daniel was given the answer, and he gave credit to God. He bore witness of what God had done. If you want to have a life that counts for something more than yourself, it's not you. It won't be what you do. It will be what God has done through you. In the New Testament, we call this the gospel. In Daniel's day, he just called God. There is not a magician, there's not a man, there's not anyone that can tell the king what he needs to know, but there is a God who can, and I know him. It's a life that bears witness for God. There's a final thing I want to share with you this morning. A life that counts is a life that leaves a legacy. So what is a legacy? Can I leave a legacy at my age? Absolutely you can. We often think of legacy in terms of death. But I can assure you, Pastor Sam is not dying. At least I don't think I am. And you're not either. I'll pray that God will give us all more time that he might be glorified. A legacy is different than a memorial. Last week we talked about Memorial Day, how we set up stones of remembrance so we can remember the past. But a legacy is something that carries on after you're gone. Not just after you're gone in death, but after you're gone from somewhere. After you leave this place. 
when you go off to Lubbock or Waco or wherever you go, you leave a legacy behind, Hunter. After Pastor Sam, when he leaves and Dr. Allen steps in to become our pastor and lead us, I hope that I've left a legacy that will carry on, that will carry on after I'm gone. Something that not only I will be remembered by, but something that's effective. It's not about me. It's about what gets done. I pray I've left one. Daniel left a legacy in Babylon. Listen to this. Susa, as I said, is the likely place of his tomb. And at the same time of Daniel, Ezekiel was also departed from Jerusalem to Babylon in 597 B.C. This great prophet Ezekiel, some eight years after Daniel, he went there. But when he got there, he was called to be a prophet in Babylon. And he grew to be aware of Daniel's status as a righteous man of God in Babylon. And twice, Ezekiel groups Daniel with two righteous heroes in Israel's past. They are Noah and Job. Daniel's name is mentioned 70 times in our Bible, 65 in the book of Daniel, three times by Ezekiel, and two times by Jesus himself. And in each case, they talk about what Daniel did in that land of Babylon. What a difference he made. Will your life count for anything after you're gone? Not only from this earth, but from this place, from the school that you visit, from the friends that you make, from the job that you have. Does your presence in there make a difference? If you were to be gone today, would anyone notice? How would they remember you? Daniel's life was one that counted. One more story. Some of you know that Pastor Sam has a tender heart, and I like to love people. I know that I'm accused of being mushy, sentimental. There's no doubt I am. One day, you know the volleyball courts? Y'all enjoy the volleyball courts? One day, we were out in the volleyball courts, and I got a call. From one of our deacons, Brother Dennis, very serious deacon. I said, yes, Brother so-and-so. He said, have you looked out on the volleyball court lately? I said, no, I have not. Where are you right now? Well, I'm in my office. Well, look out the window. Do you notice? I said, what's that? He said, there's some girls out there, and they're scantily clad, scantily clad. I said, really? Where are you? He said, I'm in a parked car right across the street. I can see them clearly. <laughs> Praise God. He said, I just want to make you aware. I know you're the pastor. And I knew you'd be concerned about that. and I'm not sure that that's what God would have. I thanked him for his call. I hung up the phone. I took off my shoes, my socks. I happen to have socks on that day. I usually don't. I rolled up my pants and went outside to the volleyball court and played volleyball with the kids. The deacon drove off. Why do I tell you that story? Well, that's who I am. For ill or not, some of you would wish I wouldn't be that way so much, I suppose. I'm an open door kind of guy. Y'all come. I believe God has placed us here for a purpose. And we only have eight acres, and I think that's a blessing. It keeps it from being about us for that sending place. Do you know that 40 young men and women have left this church to go into full-time ministry? That over the course of 28 and a half years, that over 2,000 people have been baptized? And did you know that there's $15 million worth of property at cost right here? And yet that's really not the miracle of these buildings at all. It's the lives that have been changed and impacted. This church has left a legacy of mission support. And your presence here leaves a legacy. We care about you. Some churches today honored 50, 60, and 100 graduates. And we'd love to have that big group. But we had 19. And we know you and we love you. And we're sending you out from here to be something extraordinary for Christ's sake. This church will always love you. But I got one thing more for you than that God loves you even more the legacy is what you leave behind that carries on so Pastor Sam had wrote, wrote a song and uh, some of you know that in my former life I played the guitar and sang so I wrote one for you and for the church it's called the blessing song for the church the tune's been rummaging around in my head for quite some time and uh, it finally came to me that I needed to sing it 
to this church. And uh, I hope that you hear my heart, young people, and moms and dads and church, because this is the legacy that I want to leave you. I think we already have this. But it's called Bless the Child and the Children, because that's really who we are. And I think what God can most use. Bless the child, the children. Bless the old ones too. Bless them as you walk along, just as he would do. Bless the moms, the daughters, the fathers and sons who the ones you pass their care for them the way he cares for you care there too bless them all on whom kindness has not shined bless even the one Bless the small, the weak ones, the ones so rarely seen. Live to bless them all and such. Learn the treasure this life brings. Lift your hands in mercy. Wipe what tears you may. Love is God has called. Give yourself away, give yourself away. Bless them all on whom kindness has not shined. Bless even the ones who hate. Bless all child of the children bless the old ones too bless them as you walk along just as Christ would do bless the moms and daughters fathers and sons too the ones you pass them care for them way he cares for you, care there too. Thank you, guys. I love y'all. Thank you. Be seated just a minute. Well, needless to say, that's my blessing to you, Paige, Pam, Miss Parrish, you guys, Chandler. That's what God wants you to do. It's easy to be stinky. It's easy to be selfish. But take a big heart. Have a big heart. See what God can do. If he can take somebody average like me, the strong C student that I was, <laughs> and use me in a small way, what might he do with you? 
I think a lot. And I love you so much. Let's pray together. Father, I thank you so much for your word. And I pray that you would use it in our lives. Like you did in Daniel's. To make a difference. Tomb still stands today in Susa. And even that place in Iran knows the story of this man who brought God's message to them. So God, I pray that we might be a Daniel. But more than that, we might model after our Lord Jesus Christ who died on Calvary's cross for us. We can't all do that, but he certainly is a great example for us. So God, use this word, this challenge in our lives to make us what you want us to be. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.